What I heard, Scott, it sounded like an awesome song. I, I, I love that, that song. So, uh, Good morning, everyone, again. Uh, if you don't have a church bulletin, go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll get you a bulletin. I have some ushers in the back. And you might want to follow along. Uh, there's an outline of today's sermon. Uh, there's scripture on the back of the, the, the outline, and you may want to follow along with that corresponds to the Pew Bible in, in front of you. You know, I was watching a, a video the other day of a, of a street preacher, and he put out a microphone, and he allowed anyone who had a question to, to step up to the mic, and he tried to answer it the best that, that he could. Well, one troubled man stepped up to the mic, and he asked about Christians who die in sin. In other words, that they, maybe they had some addiction or something, but they, they were, and they were in bondage to that sin. And he, he asked the question, so are they going to go to hell? And I didn't agree with the street preacher's answer, otherwise I would be showing you his video. <laughs> Understand something, salvation is not like some vending machine. Where you put in some coins and you get a little bit of forgiveness and salvation here and, here and there. When you receive Jesus Christ, you receive forgiveness of sins, you receive salvation. And the, the best illustration I can think of is... is Everyone have a Bible? Probably you don't have a Bible, but if, if you had your Bible and you had a pen, put your Bible, or, or let's say this paper and a pen. This paper represents forgiveness. This paper represents uh, uh, salvation, eternal life. And I put this in the Bible. This Bible represents Jesus Christ. And if I were to give this Bible to you, when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive salvation. You receive forgiveness. Because there is forgiveness and salvation in Jesus Christ. And to say you have Jesus Christ, but you don't have salvation and forgiveness of sins, well, that's a contradiction, isn't it? That, that's just not, not possible. It's not good theology. Because if you're in Christ and Christ is in you, then you can be confident and celebrate the fact that you have forgiveness of sins. You have salvation. When Christ died on the cross for your sins, how many of your sins were in the future? All of them. So he died for all of your sin, past, present, future, right? This morning I want to look at a, a, a woman in the Bible. I want to look at a woman who, who celebrated the fact that she had forgiveness of sins. And if you would, look at Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And if you have a pew Bible, it's page 1573 in front of you. Now, this story may sound a little bit familiar to you, but what we're going to read is how, how this, this uh, uh, well, woman of the night, how she uh, uh, anoints Jesus' feet with her tears and cleans her, uh, his feet with her hair and kisses his feet. And, and it's a similar story to, to Mary of Bethany that we read in John chapter 12 about a week before Jesus went to the cross. But don't get these two stories confused because they're, they're two different ones. So page 736, I'm sorry, uh, Luke 736, page 1573. Are you there? Good. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, we don't know why the Pharisee invited Jesus. I, uh, I believe that he invited Jesus to try to trick him up or trap him to, to do something. But either way, Jesus was invited to this Pharisee's house, and he's reclining at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. 
As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, Hmm, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. (laughs) Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and another 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love more? Simon replied, well, I suppose the one with the bigger debt. That's forgiven. Jesus said, you have judged correctly. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, we thank you, Father, for your holy word. We thank you, Father, that through your word we can, we can learn more about you. We can uh, learn more about our relationship with you. We can learn more about all the promises that we have our yes in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for, for all those who are here this morning. Father, we know that you have brought them here for, for this reason, to hear this message here today. I don't believe anyone is here by, by accident. So, Father, I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to the truth of your word here today. I pray that you would use me as your instrument. Father, uh, this, this broken clay pot, may you pour your Holy Spirit into and be glorified through me, Father Lord. So, Father, into your hands I commit this sermon. Into your hands I commit this worship service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, when, when this woman walked into the room... The, the banquet room, I'm sure everybody there was, was stunned. And they weren't stunned because of her appearance. They were stunned because who she was. You see, she had a bad reputation. More than likely, she was a prostitute, a woman of, of the night. She was a, a classified sinner. She had a terrible reputation. And they were probably muttering to themselves, what is a woman like this doing in a place like this? with the Pharisees, with the religious leaders, and, and with this supposed prophet. That's what they're, they're, they're thinking. But she ignored their stares, she ignored their comments, and she just made a, a beeline right to the guest of honor, Jesus Christ. And that, that took guts. And we can only assume that she had met Jesus prior to this event. Maybe she, it was a one-on-one encounter, maybe like the woman at the well, or maybe it was in a crowd. But either way, we know that she, somewhere along the line she had encountered Jesus, and her life had been changed dramatically. In those days, when a, 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 they would have a banquet meal like that, it would be out in a, a, in a courtyard. Now imagine this, this is a courtyard, maybe cut it half the size, and surrounded by the house. So we're, we're outside, and we're at the banquet table, and they don't sit table and chairs. Imagine this would be the, the table here, and what they would do is they would lean with, uh, on the table with pillows and have their feet going behind them. So that's how the woman uh, uh, was able to anoint Jesus' feet because his feet were behind him. And she was able to come into the the courtyard because they normally opened up the courtyard to the poor people in the city. They could come have the scraps of food. And they could also listen to uh, uh, the, the speaking, the teaching going on at the time. So now we find this woman going up to Jesus with a very expensive vial of of perfume. Her, her intention was to uh, anoint Jesus' feet. But she couldn't even make it to open up the bottle when, when the tears just started coming out of her, her eyes. 
And, and her tears just covered Jesus' feet, and she, she wiped his feet with her hair, and she kissed his, his feet repeatedly. And it was only after she did all this, she could finally gain her composure enough to then anoint her feet for the reason she came in with, with the perfume. You know, she was so overwhelmed with gratitude. She was so thankful for what Jesus had done in his life. And she wanted to express it the only way she knew how. You see, she wasn't doing this to earn forgiveness. She was doing this because she already had forgiveness. And she was so overwhelmed with joy and gratitude. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes words just can't express the gratitude or the love that we have. So this was how she was expressing her, her gratitude. And I, I think it's a beautiful act of, of worship. However, we see Simon, the Pharisee, the owner of the house, standing, looking at this. And what is he thinking? Hmm. Uh, Jesus really knew who this woman was. He wouldn't allow, if he was really a prophet, who he says he is, he would not allow this, this sinful woman to, to touch his feet. He would avoid her like the plague. So Jesus, knowing uh, his thoughts, showing that he read his thoughts, he, he, he tells this, this uh, uh, beautiful story or illustrates a story. And I want to look at five truths of the story. And first, if you have your hand out, that we can learn from, from the story that Jesus told. First of all, God's forgiveness is a gift of grace. God's forgiveness is a gift of grace. Simon was thinking, what? She does not deserve to come up to Jesus. So he was thinking of, of, of deserving. Uh, certainly, if Jesus was the Messiah, this woman did not deserve to touch him. On the other hand, Simon thought, I deserve it. Right? Because I'm good. I'm religious. I'm, I'm righteous. I do, I do good things. So Jesus told this story about a money lender. And he said, one owed 50 denarii, which that's equal to about one day's wage. And the other owed 500 denarii. So one owed a small debt, which was about two, two months' pay, and the other a pretty large debt, about one and a half years' pay. But though their, their debts differed, they both had the same problem. And what problem was that? They couldn't pay. They, one had a big debt, one had a small debt, but they both had the same problem. They both went empty-handed to the debt collector, and they were pleading for, for leniency, pleading for, for, for more time. And then something unexpected happened in verse 30, 42. It says what? Jesus telling the story. He said, the debt collector, he canceled the debt. He forgave the debt. And the root word here is the root word for grace. The New American Bible says, he graciously forgave. I like that translation. He graciously forgave the debt. You see, grace is getting something we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting something we deserve. So Jesus was trying to point out to, to Simon that the money lender freely by grace forgave their debt. They didn't deserve to be forgiven of their debt. You know, back then, if you couldn't pay your debt, you were thrown into jail until you can pay your debt. But the money lender showed, showed grace. Now, in this parable, the one who owed 500 denarii was illustrated as what? The, the sinful woman. And the one who had 50 denarii in debt was the Pharisee. Jesus illustrating the point. At least in Simon's mind, that's probably what he thought. But Jesus' point, again, was they both had the same problem. They both had the same problem. They had a debt they couldn't pay. And you know what? We all have the same problem. The Bible says wages of sin is death. Is it warm in here? I'm hot. No? I'm always hot. So I'm, okay. But the Bible says the wages of sin is death. I, I need a tall volunteer. Who's tall here? Anybody tall? All right, Charlie, you come up here. I'll be the tall guy. Now. What we, what we got to do is beyond that roof is the moon. So let's try to touch the moon. Ready? Oh. Now who's closer? I'm closer. Man, you fall short, dude. Right? <laughs> but we all have the same, we both have the same problem, which is what? We can't reach the moon. That's, that's impossible for us. Even though I might be a little higher than Charlie, we both have the same problem. Thank you, Charlie. Good job. Good job. <laughs> 
we both have the same problem that we can't touch the moon. Understand something. We have a debt that we cannot pay as Christians. And that's what Jesus said on, on the Sermon of the Mount. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, blessed are those who come to me and who, who are spiritually bankrupt. And they say, Lord, and there's all lint flying in my pocket. Don't worry about that. They say, Lord, we have nothing that we can bring before you. No righteousness on, on our behalf. No good works, you know, because they're like filthy rags in your eyes. We have nothing, Lord. All we can do is plead for your mercy. Plead for your forgiveness. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, blessed are, are the poor in spirit. And you know, we're poor in spirit. Each and every one of us. When he looks at us, we may live good religious lives like the Pharisee, but you know what? Religion, while it's good, won't get you to heaven. Going to church won't get you to heaven, but we're supposed to go to church. Why? Well, my mom said so. No. <laughs> because Jesus Christ instituted the church. This is his body. We're to come together as believers and to serve him and, and to worship him together. We're part of a, a church family. But understand something, Christians. Our hope is in Jesus Christ alone. And not by works. Not by works. No one can boast. We're, we're in debt just as, just as this woman was. And we don't deserve anything. You see, the Pharisee stood there that day, this beautiful act of worship going on, and he was thinking of deserving. Wasn't he? That's what he, I, well, I deserve to be here. This woman does not deserve to be here. What if God were to treat us as our sins deserve? Do any of us deserve to be treated by God's love and grace? No. That's why it's called grace. We're getting what we don't deserve. You see, God saw our sinful condition, and he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. He did nothing wrong, but he saw our sinful condition. He said, you know what? I, I don't want to treat you as your sins deserve. I want to have grace and mercy and compassion upon you. John 3.16, who can quote it? Somebody stand up and quote John 3.16. All right. Good. Thank you so much. Good job. For God so loved you, the world, you. Think about that. I thank God every day he doesn't treat me as my sins deserve. Amen? Amen. Let's look at the second truth. God's forgiveness is life-changing. Verse 47 he says, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she has loved much. So Jesus didn't ignore her sins, did he? He acknowledged that she had great, great sins. She had many sins. Jesus agreed. Yes, she is a terrible sinner, right? But then he said, what? But her many sins have been forgiven. So Jesus may be telling Simon, look, I, I, I had met this woman before, and I, I forgave her sins then, and she remains forgiven now. And she came to Jesus a, a sinner, but she left forgiven. Let that sink in for a minute. She came to Jesus as a sinner, but she left that day forgiven. And I don't know where you're at today, but maybe you've come in here today loaded with, with sin and shame and, 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 and guilt. But you can leave here today forgiven. You can leave here today different than, than how you came in. And nothing, when Jesus forgives you, nothing will ever change the fact that you're forgiven. It doesn't matter what the Pharisees say. It doesn't matter what anybody says. If Jesus says you're forgiven... You're forgiven. That's, that's really all that matters, right? That's all that, all that matters. Uh, Jesus turned to the woman and, and, and said, your sins are forgiven. You continue to be forgiven no, no matter what. And wh when God forgives, he forgets. Uh, look at Jeremiah. Stay where you're at. Look at, uh, or hold your place. Look at Jeremiah 31, 34, page 1197 in the Pew Bible.
And while we're looking there, can somebody look for Isaiah 43, 25? Who's got that one? Isaiah 43, 25. Who wants to read that? Somebody. Raise your hand. Okay. Larry, you got it. Isaiah 43, 25. I'm going to read to you Jeremiah 31, 34. Are you with me? The Lord says, I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. Do you understand that? He, he, when, when you ask God to forgive you, he says, I forgive you. And then what does he do? He forgets. He forgets about it. So if he forgets about it, what are you doing remembering about it? I'll tell you why. Because the accuser day and night, comes to you and reminds you of all your past failures, all of your past sin. You see, it doesn't matter what the accuser says. It doesn't matter what the Pharisees say. It doesn't matter what anybody says. It matters what Jesus says. And Jesus says, you're forgiven. And Jesus said, not only do I forgive you, I remember it no more. I remember it no more. So the the next time Satan reminds you of those sins, you tell him, take it up with Jesus. Take it up with Jesus, because Jesus said he forgave me, and he remembers it no more. Larry, you want to stand up and read that? Mm. You see, your forgiveness doesn't last for a day, a week, a month, a year. Your forgiveness lasts for all eternity. When you receive Jesus Christ, you receive forgiveness. You receive salvation. Do you understand that? 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, God says, I am faithful and just and will forgive you and purify you from all unrighteousness. Not only that, he says, and then I forget about it. I hit the clear button and I forget about it. It's gone. It's done with. So quit beating yourself up about it, will you? Right? And you know what? I have to think of the woman who went up to Jesus and was just crying at his feet. Do you understand what she was feeling in her heart? Do you understand the the guilt and shame that she had been carrying for years? And now she's forgiven? Do you understand the joy that she felt in her heart? That she couldn't even, even anoint his feet with the oil yet. She was just crying tears of joy. Those were tears of joy. You see, nobody had to remind this woman that she was a sinner. She knew that. Don't you think uh, she woke up every day hating her life, hating who she is as a person, torn up with guilt and, and shame? And now Jesus comes along, and he forgives her. He takes it away. And she could express it the only way that she could with, with, with her tears. Let's look at the third truth. Third truth, God's forgiveness is for you to receive. God's forgiveness is for you to receive. The sinful woman came to Jesus full of sin, garbage, and guilt, and she walked away forgiven, clean, and free. Martin Luther, he was a a Catholic monk. Even when he was a monk, he had a deep sense of, of, of shame and guilt and, and sin. And, and he would spend hours every day in the confession booth, confessing his sins to the priest over and over again. And he still had no peace in, in his life. He still had no sense of forgiveness in his life, even though he would spend hours and hours asking for forgiveness of sins. So finally, one day, the priest asked him, he said, Martin Luther, do you believe that God can forgive sin? Martin Luther said, absolutely. And said, do you believe that God can forgive your sin? And it was at that time he had a revelation, and he realized, you know what? There's nothing I can do to save myself. It's only through Christ that I can be saved. It's only through Christ that I'm I'm forgiven. And he placed his faith in, in what Christ had done for him on the cross. What did Jesus tell the woman in Luke 7, 50? Luke 7, 50. What did he say to the woman? He said, your faith has saved you. In other words, it's not what you're doing here. 
It's not because you, you anointed my feet with your tears and you kissed my feet and you did all these great works. That's not what saved you. What saved you is your faith. So she did these things because she was saved, not to earn salvation. Her faith saved her. Church, I want to ask you something. Do you believe that God forgives sin? Do you believe that God forgives your sin? Yeah, because he does. He does. If you go to him, he will, he will forgive you. Amen? I'm going to look at the uh, fourth truth. God's forgiveness enables us to experience heavenly peace. You know, did, did you all sing uh, Nothing But the Blood? Yeah, that, that's one of my favorite songs. What can wash away my sin but the blood of Jesus? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's it. You know what? Do you believe God can forgive sin? Do you believe he can forgive your sin? If you're washed in the blood of Christ, you have forgiveness. He can make you whole again. And he wants you to experience peace, heavenly peace. Look at verse 50. Jesus told the, the, the woman, he said, your faith has saved you. Then what? Go in peace. I want to ask you, do you, th do you think this woman ever experienced pre this type of peace before? And what type of peace are we talking about? We're not talking circumstance peace. We're talking a deep peace in our hearts and our lives that that's, has nothing to do with the circumstances. In fact, look at Luke 2.14. Luke 2.14. Just go back a, a, a couple of pages. Talking about the birth of Jesus Christ. And a suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with, with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. And that's what this ex woman experienced today. God's favor was upon her through Jesus Christ. So God's peace was upon her. See, only God can give this peace. You can't find this peace. You can't buy this peace. You can't manufacture this peace. It's the peace from God that he gives in our hearts, that is not based upon circumstances. And this woman experienced peace. She's not being eaten up by her conscience anymore. She's not being eaten up by shame and guilt and her sinful lifestyle anymore. She's not being eaten up by her past and her shame. That's all behind her. Jesus took it away. He forgave her. He says, I remember it no more. And you know what he did in place? He gave her peace. And there she is worshiping God crying at his feet. And the Pharisee could only stand there and say, she doesn't deserve to be there. She doesn't. I deserve to be there. Right? None of us deserve what Jesus has, has done for us. Do you understand that? <clears throat> understand something. If, if you're a Christian, and if you have asked God to forgive your sins, he has forgiven you. And he expects peace to follow. He expects it. It should follow. And if it's not, it's not because of God not providing it. It's probably because you're listening to the devil more than you are to God. Because God says, I forgive you, and then I for I've forgotten about it. Let's look at the fifth truth. God's forgiveness motivates us to love God. God's forgiveness motivates us to love God. You know, when I, I first became a Christian, my heart, I want to say was so overwhelming with love for God, but it still is. But it was so new for me back then. I, I didn't know how to express it. I, I became a Christian. And I, I sensed like this woman because, you know what, Jeff Roman was a great sinner. He still does every now and then. He's not like he used to be. You see, as a Christian, I'm a saint now who sometimes sins. 
And if you're a Christian, don't identify yourself as a sinner. That's how Satan wants you to identify yourself. Like an Alcoholics Anonymous, they stand up and say, I'm an alcoholic. How would you like to be called an alcoholic every day of your life? You're not an alcoholic. You're not a prostitute. You're not a drug user. Whatever you did in the past, that is gone. You're a new creation in Christ. You understand that? You're forgiven. You're a saint who sometimes sins. Understand something. When Jeff Roman first became a Christian, his love for the Lord was so great. And I'm not just bragging on myself, uh, but I think this should be of every Christian. And I wanted to serve him day and night. Nobody had to beg me to come to church. Nobody had to beg me to read my Bible or pray. I did these things to earn my salvation, to earn his grace. No, I did it because I had it. I wanted to worship him. I wanted to serve him. I wanted to please him. I wanted to draw closer to him. So let's look at a passage here, verse 40, 42. Jesus' point in this parable is made clear in the question he asked at the end of verse 42. He says, now which of them will love more? Simon replied, I, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. Then Jesus said to Simon in verse 44 through 46, Simon, do you see this woman here? I came into your house as an honored guest, and you did not even give me any water for my feet. Understand, that was a customary practice back then. If, if someone came into your house, they, they wore sandals, their feet were dusty, you were supposed to provide water for their feet. You remember Jesus washed the disciples' feet? Because there was no servant to do it. And that was the custom back then. You were to, to wash the guest's feet. Uh, normally the servant would do it, but Jesus took the role of the servant. And then he says, you didn't even greet me with a kiss. And that was the custom back then, that they would also greet each other with a kiss on the cheek. And then he says, you didn't even anoint my head with oil. And that was also a custom back then for, to refresh them. They would anoint the, the person's head with oil. He says, you didn't do any of these things. And then Jesus said, from this time this woman came in, she has been washing my feet with, with her tears. She hasn't stopped kissing my feet, and she has poured perfume on them, anointed my, my feet. You see, she has been forgiven much, so she loves much. She has been forgiven much, so she loves much. She knows what it means to be forgiven. She knows what it means to experience God's grace, his mercy, his peace. And I think it's indicative of the Pharisee to be standing there. How did, how did he react to Jesus? I deserve to, to be here. You know what? I, I think God's lucky to have me. Right? I am, I am the Christian of Christians. <laughs> right? None of us deserve what God has done for us. None of us. So I, I want to ask you, there's, there's two ways we can come to Jesus. We can come to Jesus like the sinful woman, on our knees before him, thankful of his grace and, and mercy. You know, sometimes I think the way we worship God, I don't think we truly understand all that Christ has done for us. I really don't. Because if we, if we truly understand what he did for us, we'd be on our faces every day, worshiping him. So we can, we can come to Jesus as the sinful woman, humble, contrite in spirit, or we can come like the Pharisee. And say, well, isn't God lucky to have me here today? Right? And God says, you know what? If you love me much, that will be demonstrated. I think the Pharisee may have liked Jesus. I don't think he loved Jesus. Right? And that was, that was demonstrated in, in the way that they, they, they came to Jesus. So we're going to have a time of, of invitation. This is your opportunity to, to respond to the message here this morning. I just want you to ask yourself, do you see yourself more like the woman who is forgiven or more like the Pharisee? How are you coming to Jesus? How, how did you come here to worship Jesus here today? And I pray that if you came here today full of sin, that you will leave here today forgiven. If you came here today not knowing Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you will leave here today forgiven, that he will take away your sin, and in place he will give you his peace. And maybe you're a Christian. You've been a Christian for some time. And maybe you feel like, you know what, I've just blown it too many times. There's no way God could ever forgive me and take me back. That's a lie straight from hell. You understand that. God, God is in the redemption and the forgiveness business. 
And if you have Christ, you have forgiveness. Do you understand that? Let's, let's pray. Father, Lord, I just I don't know how you're going to use the message here this morning. But Father, penetrate the hearts and minds of all who are here today. Let us not just go through the motions. Let us just not come here and act like we're punching in our, our time clock. But Father, let us fall on our faces before you. Let us remember the awesome God that we serve and, and all that you have done for us in Christ. And Father, we thank you so much that you don't treat us as our sins deserve. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father, that your forgiveness, well, we don't, we don't deserve it, Father Lord. And your forgiveness is, is life-changing, and it, and it should motivate us to, to, to want to serve you, to, to please you. Oh, Father, if there's someone here today who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, may this be the day that they, they surrender their lives to you. May they not worry about what other people may say. May they not worry about what other people may think. But I pray that they would just bring all their, their guilt and their shame and, and junk to you this morning. And that they could leave like the woman who met you, full of forgiveness, full of grace, full of peace. Oh, Father, we know that it's only through your Son that we can experience these things. So Father, let them come this morning. Let them come. Remove the blinders from their eyes and the hardness from their hearts.